The NFL Draft is here, and we are getting prepped with ESPN's Matt Miller. Plus, Reggie Bush got his Heisman Trophy back, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, and other golfers are getting rewarded for their loyalty to the PGA Tour, and the Chicago Bears are preparing a massive ask for public funds. It's Thursday, April 25th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Reggie Bush got his Heisman back. The former running back won the award in 2005, but returned it in 2010 after an investigation into USC revealed that Bush and his family accepted cash, travel expenses, and a place in the San Diego area where his parents lived rent-free for over a year and were given $10,000 to furnish. That, of course, was before the NIL era when all of that was expressly forbidden. But times have changed, and in recent years, Bush began publicly campaigning to get his Heisman back. He was joined in that cause earlier this year by the 2012 winner, Johnny Manziel, who announced that he would not attend the Heisman Trophy ceremony until Bush got his trophy back. With the amateurism model hanging by a thread and college athletes nearing the ability to unionize and accept direct payments, Reggie Bush's Heisman Trophy was the least of the NCAA's concern. And now it's his again. After exploring a move to the suburbs, the Chicago Bears are ready to commit long-term to the city they call home. And all they want from their city is the loyalty of their fans, the excitement that comes with the first overall pick in today's draft, and $2.3 billion. The team is expected to propose a $4.6 billion project, $3.2 billion of which would go toward a domed stadium just south of where they currently play, and $1.4 billion would go to infrastructure improvements in the surrounding area. The team wants the public to pick up half of the total tab. On top of that, the White Sox could look for around a billion dollars for a new stadium of their own. The two teams are coordinating their asks for public money in an attempt to not compete over the same funds. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has been publicly skeptical about using public funds on stadiums. In February, referring to the White Sox expected ask, he said, the taxpayer dollars are precious. Unless a case is made that the long-term investment yields a long-term return for the taxpayers that we can justify in some way, I haven't seen that yet. The Bears have been chasing a new stadium for years, but it's unclear if they're any closer to actually getting one. Tiger Woods could have taken hundreds of millions of dollars to join Live Golf. Now he's getting $100 million for staying with the PGA Tour. The tour is dividing up funds from its $1.5 billion investment from a group of sports team owners to 193 golfers in the form of equity in PGA Tour enterprises. But these slices of the pie will not be equal. Around $750 million will go to 36 golfers, led by Woods, Rory McIlroy with $50 million, and Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas, who will each get $30 million. A pool of $250 million will go to a larger swath of golfers who stay loyal to the PGA Tour, including around 75 retired golfers. The equity will vest over eight years. That's not quite live golf money. Tiger was reportedly offered $700 million to join the Saudi-funded tour. McElroy recently denied rumors that he was considering an $850 million offer from Live. Whatever the actual figures are, it's clear enough that any player that turned down Live missed out on a lot of money. But loyalty is worth something. Specifically for Tiger Woods, it's worth $100 million. I'm joined now by ESPN draft analyst Matt Miller. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. It's uh, it was it was due time. It had been a while since we had talked. So it's good yeah, to be back. yeah, exactly. You know, we we had that that brief lull in football being relatively out of our consciousness, but now it is roaring back with the the draft. So uh, we had Ian Rappaport on recently. He predicted a ton of chaos at this year's draft. Um, do you agree? And where do you think that will come from? Yeah, I do. I think that it happens every year. Uh, so yes, I do think it will happen. It's probably with the team trading up. You know, the Minnesota Vikings are a popular target as a team that would like to move up. They have two picks in the first round. They have a gigantic need at quarterback and really not much else on the roster that is an immediate need. So they're a popular team, you know, predicted to trade up. I think we could look at the number three overall pick with the New England Patriots. Number four, the Arizona Cardinals. Number five, the LA Chargers. Those are all you know, pretty realistic destinations for the Vikings to try to get to in order to get the third or fourth quarterback in this draft. If you can get a top quarterback, or if you think, or someone who could be a top quarterback, that's almost always what teams are reaching for. Um, how many do you think are going to go in the top 10? Yeah, I'll go with four. I, I think, you know, there's been a lot of debate about that number, but I feel, you know, it's cemented at this point. Caleb Williams will go first to the Chicago Bears. The Washington Commanders have the number two pick. They'll take either. I think Jaden Daniels should be the favorite. Drake May is in the mix there as well. 
Drake May, if he doesn't go two, could very well go three. And then J.J. McCarthy from Michigan, who I think is probably that most likely trade-up candidate, you know, for a team that's looking to get that fourth quarterback. There is a pretty big drop-off after that point. Michael Penix Jr., who was the Heisman runner-up from Washington. Bo Nix, who finished third in the Heisman voting from Oregon. Both good players. I have a hard time imagining them being uh, top 15 picks, maybe on the back end of the first round, but, but certainly not in the top 10. Do you see, and, and obviously when we're talking about the top of the draft, we're mostly talking about those bottom of the heap teams. Do you see any teams at a crossroads that need to kind of pick a lane here? Yeah, I think that, you know, several, that's a great point. I think the New York Jets are one of those teams. They have the number 10 overall pick and they've really went all in on this veteran movement, a 40 year old quarterback who's coming off an Achilles injury and, you know, is it seems to have a lot of interest outside of football right now. You've got two veteran offensive you tackles that, who yeah. have a lot of right uh, veteran offensive tackles who have some injury question marks. A wide receiver now, and Mike Williams has injury question marks. So I think the Jets are one of those teams where traditionally you would look at their roster and say it's time for a youth movement. It's time to get younger. It's time to fill in some of these uh, backstops, some of these positions, basically with young talent. However. It really feels like they're more all in. And with that 10th pick, instead of drafting for future need, they'll likely draft for a player that can help impact them this year because they have such a short window to try to win with Aaron Rodgers, a quarterback. Right. I mean, just the Rodgers move by itself. I mean, makes it feel like you, you can't go youth movement right now. You just have to do one more year of let's see if we can make this thing happen, even if it doesn't feel like they're going to win the Super Bowl or anything next year or like, you know, just making the playoffs would feel like, you know, an achievement for that team. Yeah, absolutely. I think in the AFC in particular, it's tough because you have Mahomes and Josh Allen and Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson. And, you know, you have the realistic question for the Jets is, you know, are, are we in that running? Are we in that mix? And if if we're not, how do we get there? And that's I think that's why the draft is so fascinating and so much fun, because one pick can get you there. Yeah. Um, stick with New York, or <laughs> claims to be in New York, actually plays in New Jersey, with the Giants. They sort of felt, I mean, they made the playoffs two years ago, but now Barkley's gone. Uh, the Daniel Jones era seems to be over. Um, are they just going to tear it all down? I don't think so. Not yet. It feels like they're another team that, that at least what they're saying publicly and to some degree privately is that they still want to give Daniel Jones one more shot. Now, that might mean drafting a quarterback in the second round as opposed to the first, but uh, it has been said by that that organization, the last time Daniel Jones was healthy, they made the playoffs, which is true. Uh, it wasn't on the back of Daniel Jones that they made the playoffs. It was a you know good defense and a good run game, but uh, it doesn't feel like they're quite yet ready to completely throw the towel in on, on Daniel Jones, at least. Yeah, I mean, they did sign him to a big deal, but also it just feels like, you know, you're not going to necessarily get a lot of shots at a big quarterback. I and mean, they might have one this year. Um, I'll, I'll throw one more team at you. The Patriots. Uh, I mean, they've just been kind of stuck in this like post Brady malaise since Brady. Um, are they going to try to use that third pick to bust out of that? I think so. And it, it feels like they have two paths they could go down. One is stick and draft a quarterback like a Drake may from North Carolina. The other is to auction that pick off and get as many draft picks as possible, which could help jumpstart a rebuild. Now, obviously, if you trade out a three, it's unlikely you're getting a quarterback, which is a need for them. But, you know, they also have needs at offensive line, wide receiver, uh, all over the place offensively, basically, you name it. They have a need there outside of running back. So uh, it is and that's really one of the interesting domino effects of the first round is what do the Patriots do? Do they, do they take the quarterback and try to find the hardest position to find in all of sports, arguably, or do they try to build the roster first and then add the quarterback in the future? And uh, there are two different schools of thought on which is the right way to do that. I, I trend more toward the build the team first, add the quarterback later, uh, but we'll see what this you know new regime does, not just post Brady, but now post Belichick. Right. I was going to say, ironically, the trade for a bunch of picks would kind of be a Belichick style move. Um, so but obviously he's, he's he's not at the helm anymore. Any other teams you think of as, as prime targets for uh, giving up their pick? Yeah, Arizona at four. We saw last year they were a team that was uh, incredibly active, moving all, all around, you know, from three to 12 to six. So I think they could be a team that could stick and pick at four. They could trade out the Chargers at five or another team that could be really, really active. Uh, and then I, I think the Washington Commanders, they're not going to move from number two. But interestingly enough, they have two selections in the second round to where they could be 
pretty active in trying to get back into the first to shore up their offensive line because they're going to have a rookie quarterback next year. And zooming out a little bit, um, I, well, what sticks in my, my brain last year, among other things, from last year's draft was Anthony Richardson using that combine to, um, to go way up the draft board. Yeah. I mean, it makes me wonder what kind of, not just players, but player attributes teams are valuing now. Is, is there kind of a move toward these raw skills? I think a little bit more so because what we're finding is, you know, so many guys get coached up at the next level. Like very few people are coming into the NFL ready to go. And so I think because of that, you're now betting on traits. And we can thank Patrick Mahomes, uh, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson as guys who started that trend and, and where teams have had a lot of success by saying, let's bet on the traits, see if we can coach up the rest. Now, the, the opposite side of that would be a C.J. Stroud, who wasn't lauded with the you know generational traits last year, like an Anthony Richardson, and he turned the Houston Texans franchise around in one year and one offensive rookie of the year had that team in the playoffs. So it is, you know, again, there's, there's always going to be, I think, diverging thought processes on how you evaluate quarterbacks and what you're exactly looking for. But uh, traits do tend to win out. And I, I think we'll even see that to some degree this year, you know, with a player like Drake may being selected over guys like Michael Penix and Bo Nix, who were much more successful in college, had much longer college careers, but they don't have the physical attributes that he has. And that is certainly why he's being, you know, promoted as a top three pick. Is there um, a different kind of model? I mean, the Niners kind of did it, but um, uh, even that with Purdy, like Purdy became a star quarterback. Anyway, is that just kind of where we're at, where teams don't really think of themselves as realistic without a superstar quarterback? Yeah, I think you can look at the last, off the top of my head, 30 years, you know, we went from Peyton Manning, to Tom Brady, you know, I mean, really, we went from like Joe Montana to Troy Aikman to Brett Favre to Peyton Manning, but certainly in the last 25 years, it has been dominated by Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes. And the years that they didn't win the Super Bowl, which they've won 10 of the last 24, which is is pretty ridiculous. uh, Those years that they didn't win, it was almost, you know, like there was the Matthew Stafford year where the Rams were like a super team. Stafford's a good quarterback. But they had a great team. I think we can even look at those Giants teams that took down the Patriots. They had a really good quarterback in Eli Manning. They had great teams, you know, great defensive lines with Steve Spagnuolo. The Eagles team that beat the Patriots, um, not great quarterback play from Nick Foles, but he got hot at the right time. And they had a, they, you know, it was just a matchup nightmare for kind of an older Patriots team at that point. So I do think looking at it holistically and saying, you either have the great quarterback and you can make that run or you have to have a great team and probably get a little bit lucky. You know, I would say the Niners got kind of lucky at times last year to make that run that they did through the postseason and you know, to have a lead at, in, the, in the first half again against the Chiefs and see it squandered away. Uh, but they have a great team, you know, Hall of Fame left tackle, arguably a Hall of Fame running back, two great wide receivers, a great tight end, and on defense, a ton of talent as well. So it, it's that argument of great team, with a good quarterback or a great quarterback. And right now, you know, Mahomes is certainly at the top of that list. Obviously been very quarterback focused today, but uh, what other positions or, or I guess attributes are teams looking for um, as, as they build out the rest of their team? Yeah. Value the most is their core position groups, left tackle and wide receiver are up there. And then on defense, it is, you know, you need one pass rusher at least, and you need one cover man. So we saw this offseason salaries for defensive tackles exploded. You know, guys are getting $30 million a year for defensive tackle pay now. So I think you can always look at that. You know, where are the salaries going in the NFL? That's the important positions, you know, safeties, tight ends, off-ball linebackers, running backs, centers. Those positions just aren't being paid, and, and that does speak to how they're valued and, and the replacement value of them to kind of steal a money ball phrase of how hard is it to replace this player. If it's fairly easy, you're probably not going to pay them a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and before I let you go, just like any kind of um... – I, I guess I've already made you do a lot of predictions, but just like, what are you anticipating you know, like going into to the draft here? Yeah, I, I anticipate, like I know Ian said this, chaos, but I think we will see a record number of players on offense drafted, not just because the shift in the NFL, you know, going that way more of, of offense is dominating, but this is a, a very, very deep group of offensive talent. So wide receivers, offensive linemen, we can see record number at both positions 
And I wouldn't be surprised of the 32 first round picks, if 20 of them are, are spent on offensive players this year. Yeah. Wow. Matt Miller, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Yep. You bet. Thanks. That's it for today. Share the show with a friend you think would enjoy it. And if you are that friend, go ahead and hit subscribe. We have great stuff from across the sports world coming at you every weekday. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.